Thank you. Yeah, you want some? <clears throat> there you go. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wen, and I'm a founding partner of Matter Venture Partners. Uh, it's a venture capital firm I started last year in 2023 after 17 years at Kleiner Perkins. And the reason I started the firm, uh, Matter Venture Partners, is because I realized that to invest in hard tech the way it should be done, you need a whole ecosystem in order to support the founders and entrepreneurs. And so today I have the good opportunity to invite Andy on the stage here. And um, he and I are gonna tell some truths and hardships about creating a successful hard tech company, particularly in the area of robotics. Oh, yeah. uh, you heard the title about the Holy Trinity, right? Um, that can be construed as being very biblically good or devilishly hard. And you know, it's hard enough to create a startup that just does software. And it can be hard enough to start a startup that just does hardware. And it's hard enough to start a startup that just does AI. Imagine combining the three of them and having to get it to work. And that's something that Andy has actually done in the last seven years. So why don't we start with the origin story, Andy? Yeah. Well, thank How you did guys. How you become an entrepreneur? Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so uh, like any founder, I think one of the biggest, most impactful things, most important things is just to be passionate. <clears throat> so when everyone talks about like, what's your founding story, I actually like to talk more around what got me excited and passionate about working in hardware. Um, and so when I was doing my PhD in machine learning, I did a couple of uh, internships, one at a place called the, Intellig or the Institute of Human Machine Cognition. We were working on two major projects. One was for NASA and one was for Boston Dynamics. And I got the opportunity to work on both. Uh, the Boston Dynamics one was to focus on legged locomotion for Atlas, the original Atlas about 10 years ago. And then the NASA one was to work on an exoskeleton. Um, and NASA had two purposes. One, they wanted their astronauts to be able to work out in space. And so, you know, when you wake up every day and you're, you're there putting in time to make sure that the astronaut has a six pack, it's cool, but it doesn't really motivate you that much. The second piece though, was to be able to give legs back to people that were paralyzed. And that part was on paper, really cool, really intriguing, and something I was passionate about. But when you actually saw it in person, it was a holy shit moment of, I gotta be in this, I wanna be in hardware, I wanna be in tech. And the moment for me was truly, we hit a milestone, and it was the first time that we were able to allow somebody that was paraplegic to actually drive the hardware. And they came in rolling in on their wheelchair, and this was a veteran that had uh, been paralyzed in war. His entire family was there, and like any classic good tech company, you know, we got them there at you know, nine in the morning. And then after hours and hours and hours to try to get it to work, we were really struggling. But the guy was dedicated to staying there, dedicated to get it done. And basically after five hours of working through all the bugs again, we were able to see him physically walk. Physically walk after a decade of being in a wheelchair. And his entire family erupted out into tears. The entire room was shook. We just stopped. And just seeing that impact, seeing how important it could be to actually do things with real atoms in the physical world, it really brought it home to me that I knew I wanted to be in hard tech. I knew I wanted to do deep tech, hardware, and software together to move humanity. That's very inspirational. I can see how that would move you to action as an entrepreneur. But tell us about PATH. Why robotics? and why in the welding industry? Yeah, so Path Robotics is AI robotics for manufacturing. Long story short, we make skilled laborers. We take hardware, we give it intelligence to be able to do, do really hard tasks that only skilled laborers can do today. And why we went after that, again, we wanted to do something that we were passionate about. And you look, when you looked at just the United States, <clears throat> there's a 2.1 million person vacancy needed to really keep up with delivering the hard goods, the hard goods that built this facility, the hard goods that built these lights, the hard goods of the chairs you're sitting on. Every single thing around us isn't built by machines, it's built by humans. It's built by skilled humans that are not showing up anymore, skilled humans that don't want to do these jobs anymore. And when we looked at the 2.1 million, it's like, a, it's a big, big number to go after. We want to find something even more specific. And we looked at the hardest labor class by far, 
We talked to 100 US manufacturers. We went to their facilities and we talked to the people doing these jobs. And the number one hardest job that we saw, people that were leaving every day covered in smoke, people that had been doing this job for 10 to 20 years that were now blind because they'd been looking at ultraviolet light. Welding was that job. Welding was the job that these people were grinding through every single day. And it was a 400,000 person vacancy in the United States. And we decided we want to go help manufacturing, help these people, help these companies. So we started to focus on making robots smart enough to be able to do the job of welding and assembly and manufacturing. So I think most people here, when you talk about robotic welding, they have a vision of, say, Tesla cars moving down the line and these big, powerful arms coming and doing spot welding on a car and the car moves on. How do you do welding differently or similar to that? What is path relative to what most people may think of welding? Yeah, so 99% of my customers are companies that you have never heard of and you will never hear of. Middle manufacturing is what actually powers the entire world. It makes all the products that we see besides our cars. Those companies have human beings that show up, and it's not on a line. It's them showing up and going into a work cell. It's them holding a welding torch, looking at the puddle every single day. That's the companies that we help. And so when we look at our systems, this isn't a line that's producing 10 million of the exact same product. This is a company that can make 10,000, 10,000 different things. And there's a high mix, high variability, and a need for high skill. Need for something that has a brain, that has eyes, that has the ability to sense and learn from what it did. So you talk about brains, and we talked about earlier software and AI and hardware. How do those three pieces in the Holy Trinity come together to create a solution that, I guess your goal is to replace a human being, right? Yeah. A human being who's doing welding, and I suspect none of our children want to do that job anymore. And so how do you get those three pieces to come together in a way that actually delivers human quality welding? Yeah, so maybe I'll do it this way a little bit. I'll, I'll break it down. So if anyone's in hardware, software, and AI in this room, I'll try to leave with like a piece of advice here. And so when you're doing all three together, there's different aspects and different components. But I can guarantee you that your software team will be your fastest team by far. It will be the team that has had the most structure, we have amazing protocols over the last 50 years of building really great software. AI is brand new. AI is very unpredictable. You have no idea if what you're building is actually going to be useful. So to get these timelines to actually align to hitting something and be able to execute, on the AI side, one of my pieces of advice is start early with the foundation. Data is going to be the fuel for you building out these specific models that are going to go do things. So really, really focus on the data infrastructure. Make sure that's buttoned up. When you have ML engineers and they're being ML ops engineers, that's when you're going to see the slowdown and your software team is going to outpace your AI team. So focus on building the foundation of data. On the hardware side, hardware is notoriously 5 to 10x longer dev cycles. You just can't get away from it. You have to procure it, you have to design, you have to procure, you have to test. All these things add up in time that makes all your roadmaps extend exponentially. So what I tell all the hard tech founders that are jumping into this space, be really, really tactical about what you build versus what you buy. You don't want to go build something that's not going to give you some sort of huge competitive advantage. You want to focus on buying that. You want to take and take your shrink your roadmap as much as you can Find the one, two, three, four, five percent thing in your entire hardware package that truly moves the needle and throw everybody at that. Buy everything else. And then over time, you can start to build and build competitive advantage in the other space, but really, really focus in. And when we did this, when we started off, the opportunity in front of us, I came out of humanoids. My, my research was deep reinforcement learning for humanoid robotics. And I made the choice very early. We weren't going to build a humanoid. We're not going to build the entire platform. We're going to go buy off-the-shelf robots. We're going to buy off-the-shelf welders. We're going to buy off-the-shelf safety equipment. And we're going to focus on the one piece of hardware, the piece of hardware that fuels the data gen for everything, the eyes and the sensor. And so we put all of our hardware team, all of our hardware efforts into building that one piece of technology that's the fuel to making all the decision making on the fly and then we made everything else and we bought it. And because of that, we were able to align schedules. We were able to align the roadmap so that everybody executed and delivered at the exact same time 
to actually build a product that would go into the real world. And so much in the hardware, software, AI, there's so many of them out there at this point. And everyone's raising a ton of money. But the biggest thing is nobody's actually gotten to execution. No one's ever got to delivery. I feel like we're one of three in the world at this point that's actually been able to button it all up and deliver it and start to scale revenue aggressively. And you got to be ruthless and relentless on the execution side to do it. I want to go back to the hardware piece because that's actually why our venture firm calls deep tech hard tech because actually it's a really hard thing to do. So we call it hard tech. Um, in the build, I understand, but in the buy, you're a little company. You're basically nobody. You call up a big vendor and say, hey, I'm going to be really special one day. I'm going to be Tesla. Give me a good deal. Give me some good volume. Give me some good support. And you know, all you hear is a dial tone on the other end. <laughs> How do you get attention from a big company in order to buy all the things you like to off the shelf on favorable terms in the time that you need with the specs that you require as basically in a startup case, you're nobody in the industry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the reality is you can't hand this job off. As a CEO or founder, you're probably product-led, product-focused. You probably have a technical background. You want to dedicate 90% of your time on the product. You want to work with your engineers. You want to build that product. That's what everybody does. And then you start to get to deployments or like early development, and you're like, I'll hire a VP of supply chain. I'll hire a VP of ops. The reality is that person's not going to be able to move the needle for you. You're going to have to be in all these conversations. When you're the small guy and you're looking at the, and you're buying MSRP out of a catalog, you're losing or you're leaving 70 to 90% on the table. Instead of buying for $100 a piece, you could really be buying for 30, 20, or 10. But it all starts with being able to go from the top down. At any company that I've ever sourced from, if I've tried bottoms up, I have failed. I pay maybe a 10% discount. I don't pay a 70 or an 80 or 90% discount. The only way to do that is by building relations from the top down. And what we've seen in our experience, the only way to do that is surround yourself with board members, advisors, additional leaders that can get you that intro. I just came, actually, we, ju we just came from, we flew out here from Japan. Because Wen was with me, and he opened the door to the chairman of one of the largest robotics companies in the world. And we're building a relationship all the way at the top to really drive our pricing down. And we're looking at discounts that are on, truly on the 80%. And this wasn't done by hiring or passing the buck to somebody else. This was done by being the CEO and driving these relationships and building that out. If you want to build hardware, it's notorious. No matter what, you are going to have to buy at some point. And as CEO or founder, I recommend that you take that on your shoulders because if you pass it, you're going to see your working capital just blow up through the roof. Thank you for the advertising. The check's in the mail. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> All right, so um, you talked about buy versus uh, build. Um, people have always said that you know, hard tech or deep tech companies are difficult to finance. And I think the difficulty falls in two points, right? One is actually raising the dollar amount that you need. And the second one, as you alluded to earlier, is who do you take money from? I know you've had a lot of experience in this space. Path has been around for seven years. You've raised over $200 million. You've met every type of investor out there. What advice would you give for the young, early, hard tech, robotics entrepreneur in terms of how to go about financing? Because it's an art. There's no Harvard Business School class that you can take that tells you exactly what to do. It's a lot of scars and a lot of learning. What would you say? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've raised almost $300 million in capital. And for a hardware deep tech company, you really need an immense amount of capital. These development cycles are not short. They're extremely long. Getting to product market fit is not a six month try. And so when you think about the financing side, one, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to raise a decent amount of capital. And how do you do it? One, you obviously lead with vision, of course. And so everyone in this room has probably heard a lot of talks on how to raise capital, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about who do you raise capital from. So the brutal truth is if you're in hardware, software, and AI, 90% of VCs out here are going to know nothing about your space. It's just the reality of it. Most people are coming from a SaaS background. Most people are coming from a um, you know, B2C. And we're B2B enterprise delivering hard goods. 
There's 10% of the market out there, 10% of the financers out there that really understand your market. And when you're a small company and you really want to go build something special, you have to prioritize having killers around you, people that actually know your product, people that actually know what you're going to go build, and people that can help you in all layers. And so my biggest recommendation to any, any startup in this space is don't take money just on valuation. You should be evaluating the financing group as much as they're evaluating you. And I've done this before. I've made massive mistakes. I've taken a huge amount of massive checks from groups that didn't understand this and it actually slowed my company drastically down. And I spent a lot of time on Excel spreadsheets versus a lot of time on planes visiting suppliers, visiting customers, ingratiating myself with the surrounding community that could actually build out this company. So my biggest, my biggest, like, my biggest feedback would just be really focus on somebody that's going to sit next to you, be in the trenches, fly all over the world with you, because that's the actual financing group that you need to truly make it, as 99% of us in the hardware, software, AI space ultimately die. And you're going to need that all-in investor that can drive tangible value to you every single day. And the brutal reality is there's not a lot of them out there. So let me be uh, a little bit sarcastic. I haven't met a VC that doesn't say they add value. How do you know they really do before it's too late? <laughs> I mean, the biggest way you know is that they'll fly around the world with you. That's the biggest way. You need to push them to actually buy in, to put skin in the game. Cash is great. You need it, obviously but it's not going to end up defining your company. The people around you is going to be what's to define your company. And so we always ask all of our investors to truly jump on a plane, travel to a customer, jump on a plane, take us to a supplier, jump on a train or a plane, take us to the head of talent somewhere, take us to see and meet some great AI talent. You need people that are actually going to jump on a plane and fly with you to move the needle for your business. And again, we, what, what, we've been around the, the world 10 times in the last six months, really? <laughs> Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Um, hard tech with software plus AI. As we know, people are the inputs to businesses. Technology is an output. How do you think about hiring your first people uh, while you're dealing with the Holy Trinity? <laughs> All right, I'll go a couple ways on this. Um, does anybody know Columbus, Ohio? Nobody. Nobody knows Columbus, Ohio. I think right? it's the wrong audience. One person, two people. <laughs> no one knows Columbus, Ohio. That's where we're headquartered. Middle of fucking nowhere is basically where we're headquartered. And so everybody asked me at the beginning when, I, when we started this company, uh, when are you going to move to the Bay Area? When are you going to move to the Silicon Valley? And the answer was, I'm not. There's two things that matter when you start a company. There's two most important things. Your people, by far the biggest asset, and understanding, learning, and being obsessed with your customer. Silicon Valley has people, right? They don't have manufacturers that need my technology. 90% of my customers live in the middle of the United States, not on the coast. So we made the hard call very early, which is we're going to be next to our customer. We're going to learn everything about them. We're going to deliver a piece of hardware there. We'll be right there to support it. Then we had to solve the people problem then. So, you know, there's no smart people in Columbus, supposedly. <laughs> Wrong. There's smart people fucking everywhere. There's smart people everywhere. The biggest difference is the culture. Culture in Silicon Valley is one of fail fast and learn, take huge shots, be all in, be aggressive, take risk. That's the exact opposite culture of Columbus, Ohio. And so for a CEO and a founder, it was on me and the rest of my team to go build that culture because the people are there. You can find brilliant people everywhere. But if you don't establish the culture, if you don't establish it early and allow people to take risk and build the culture that's built in Silicon Valley, you're never going to build the company that you want. And so those are the two major things that I really focused on to ensure that we had and that capability to build that company that we wanted. That's not easy to do in Columbus, Ohio. I'm not sure you're running for a mayor, but <laughs> you gave a good pitch for Columbus, Ohio. Question. So you're starting this company you know, it's you and your brother, right? You founded the company with your brother. I'm not sure I would found a company with my brother, but you're very courageous. Um, what do your first hires look like? Are, yeah. are you, you and your brother are very technical. You guys, uh, you know, were PhD dropouts, roboticists. But beyond that, where do you start? Do you, do you hire another AI person, a software person, a, a um, you know, programmer? Where do you start? 
Yeah, so just like everything else, you want to figure out a way to give yourself the biggest next advantage. So you don't want to replicate yourself. You don't want to create this massive echo chamber of just, you have now a, a company full of just AI PhDs. Um, you really want to find your biggest pain point and then go higher for that. That's, that's clear and obvious, right? And so for us, the biggest pain point, which is, again, unique in the hardware space, is selling, understanding your customer. At the, at the highest level, I make AI workers, or AI robotic workers. They're physical goods that get deployed into a manufacturing facility and run every single day like a skilled laborer. And to sell to these customers, some of these customers are 180 years old. They're running Windows 95, and that's not even a joke. Most of them are. And I'm trying to go in there and sell them a deep tech product that's running completely on neural networks, and they've never even heard of what a neural network is. And so for us, that very first sale <clears throat> to get our very first customer took me 18 months to get it done. That's not really scalable. I can't have a new customer once every 18 months. We have to be able to get it to 100 days. And so the first hire we made, our first executive, was our first customer. The president of our first customer, I did everything to get him to leave and come be an ambassador of PATH. To come be the person, the voice, to build trust with these people, to come through the person that's actually sat in the seat, that actually purchased it, that's got gray hair, that's been in manufacturing for 40 years. Somebody that could offset us, somebody that could be unique and different to us. That's again, a, a huge recommendation I would make, is find your weakness and go find the person that can truly amplify it and do everything that you can to make them move. So those, you started with the head of commercial, because that would allow you to get into customers early and that would proliferate the learning curve, right? And help you define your product. Um, I often get asked the question as a VC, you know, when should I hire a head of HR? <laughs> uh, you know, do I do it right before I go public? Do I do it once I have revenue, uh, once I'm profitable? What's yeah. your take on that? Because my understanding is um, that was a relatively early hire for PATH and I, I think you benefited significantly from that. Yeah, so our VP of people and our VP of sales, or our head of sales, our first customer, they both actually started on the first day, the uh, same day. Both hires that we made strategically. As I said, the most important thing is your people, your team, that's what's gonna actually build everything, and your customers. And so we wanted to go take both out with a single shot and get two great people. So our, our first and second hire was how to go to market and how to people. And that first person, the VP of people came in, she set the tone for the culture early. And she was the one that was really able to allow us to build an amazing company in the middle of nowhere that no one even has even heard of. And that's something that I would recommend greatly in the hardware space. You're not gonna be able to just go pattern match against Amazon and Google and just find all these people that wanna relocate. You're going to have to work on that culture. You're gonna have to work on uh, training, building, and making a great team. And so our head of people was our second VP hire, essentially, to build that foundation early for us. That's very helpful. We're sitting here in Europe, and in many ways, a lot of the hard tech people, entrepreneurs in Europe, might feel like they're in the Columbus, Ohio of the world, being in continental Europe, where hard tech ecosystem may not be as mature you know, the expertise in AI, software, and hardware may not be easy to come together. What sort of a parting advice you'd give to an entrepreneur here in continental Europe, northern Europe, about doing a hard tech or robotic AI company? Um, yeah, I, I think it would just be, you can do it. I mean, again, we did it in, a, in an area that literally nobody knows about. Europe is got... The heritage of brilliance in Europe is unfounded. It's everything. You guys have built the entire history of the world. And you don't have to be in Silicon Valley. You don't need to move to Silicon Valley to go find the people. You have them right here. You need to build the culture. You need to build the culture that replicates what they've done in Silicon Valley. You need to build a culture of fast failing, taking risk, swinging for the fences. And if you do that, you will be able to level up all the immense talent that you have here and you'll be able to go build these companies that are generational. Build these companies that are gonna change humanity. So that would be my advice is don't leave, double down, focus on the culture. And I would say also, if I could chime in, I think that Europe now has attracted um, investors from around the world. 
leverage your investors, their networks to help you bring technology and people here and help you export away from Europe to the rest of the world to help you build these global opportunities. Last question, one thought, humanoid robots. <laughs> False hype, fiction, parting thought. It's fucking hype. Thank you guys very much. All right, thank you.